I've had some experiences in South America in which um, I have been coming up river, uh, the Rio Caura, in the Guyana Shield, one person other than me in the, in the dugout canoe, and landing at a Yanomama site, uh, and being greeted by warriors that carried blowguns and darts, and had their faces tattooed, and it was quite an interesting experience. You didn't know whether to back off and run away or uh, to uh, proceed and, and bluff your way through this one. Uh, but I can imagine Bartram uh, landing here in Palatka with those same uh, feelings. You know, do I really want to do that or not? Um, so I have a, 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 a feeling for Bartram and the things that he's done with his, his life. And so I consider myself someone who would like to emulate uh, William Bartram and, and his experiences. And the common thread that he and I have is the natural history. Now I'm just going to show a couple of these timelines. And as Tom and others have said through this process, uh, there's a lot of confusion as to when he was here or there. And what I would like to do is just uh, comment that I'm not interested in what this slide says, but the fact that he was here and, and uh, Tom mentioned that John and William were here in the wintertime. And that makes a difference in what experiences they're going to have. For example, alligators do not bellow in December January and February. So there are things that he talks about uh, in his book that key me to certain seasons of the year. And it gets really confusing when he was here uh, the second time. And as Tom indicated, you know, um, it's probably a story that he's developed uh, and the timing uh, is all sort of confused and wrapped up together. <coughs> Now, one of the things I would like to suggest, uh, I was uh, uh, under the influence of Walter Offenberg and Archie Carr in my museum experiences and had conversations with them through the years. And one of the things that they taught me was that in North Florida, there are relationships. And for example, we can test some of Bartram's observations and try to figure out when he was actually doing something, where he was when he was doing it, and what season he was doing it in. And so uh, both of those fellows that were really important in my early development told me that if you know the soil type of the area that you're in, if you know the habitat, you can predict all the other things. If you know what the soil type is, you can predict the habitat. If you can predict the habitat, you can predict the kind of plants that occur. And if you have that information, you can predict the animals that occur there. It's all really tightly uh, tied together. The other thing is that uh, season, seasonality. For example, uh, we'll talk briefly about uh, pawpaws. Well, the pawpaw that uh, or one of the pawpaws that Bartram described was the one that we see here in Putnam County very abundantly, but it only flowers for about two and a half weeks uh, at the end of March and in the first week of April. So if he says that he found that pawpaw in flower and he has a drawing, we know that that's when he was at that site because that's the only time that plant blooms. So we can get information about what Bartram was doing by what we read and, and find uh, about uh, his travels. So let's talk about the pawpaw. Uh, Bartram described two uh, kinds of pawpaws. And as uh, Nancy was saying uh, last night, yeah, uh, there's a nursery rhyme about picking pawpaws and sticking them in your pocket. This is the same kind of plant, um, except the ones I think they were probably talking about were the ones that grow in a tree form. Most of the uh, pawpaws are low-growing uh, plants, but they do produce pawpaws, and they, I have eaten them. But if you're going to eat them, you have to really race the raccoons 
the possums, and um, the foxes to them because they're all out there, including me, trying to forage for them. <laughs> but let's test this, this concept that I was just mentioning. Uh, if Bartram describes this pawpaw, he had to know it from the flower. Okay, so already we know that if we're in North Florida, that pawpaw had to be in candler soils, which is a, a very sandy soil, not in apopka soils, which is another type of so, uh, upland soil around here. But the, there are other species of pawpaws which occur in these apopka soils. So by the fact that he uh, found the, this particular pawpaw, it means he was in the sand hills. And the sand hills are longleaf pine uh, sandy hills. Um, <coughs> Another thing is that when it flowers, it flowers in that early spring period, but it flowers before it gets its leaves. So that's another bit of information. Now other pawpaws get their leaves first and then flower. Uh, if we have this pawpaw, we know we are in the longleaf pine sand hills, and we would also, he would have also seen longleaf pine, he would also see turkey oak, he would see, actually there are about 300 species of sandhill plants that occur in that habitat in North Florida. It's one of the most diverse and rich uh, uh, plant communities that we have here in North Florida. Even though when you're walking around you think it all looks the same, but if you got down on your hands and knees you'll find, in fact Dave Hall and I uh, did that out at Ordway Preserve, and we were finding on the average of 50 to 60 species of plants in a 10 meter square uh, patch a burned sand hill. Okay, so and in addition, he would have seen gopher tortoises, pocket gophers, uh, six lying race runners, this whole slug of animals that are only found in that kind of habitat. Another really interesting plant that he talks about are the lupines. Well, it turns out that there are several species of lupines, and he talks about the blue lupines. And there's only one species of blue. The rest are pink. And so this is the one he had. To, he doesn't mention what, what lupine it was, other than being lupine. But the fact that he called it a blue one, it has to be this particular species, which is called the sky blue lupine. And this is another one of those plants that have a really peculiar uh, natural history. Uh, if you are riding the, the, Hawthorne, the, the uh, uh, Keystone Heights to Palatka uh, bicycle path. These things right there at Forest Road, uh, Forest Ridge Road. Uh, this spring, it was loaded with these lupines. They were in full bloom. In fact, that's where this picture was taken. Uh, but there are certain things that we know about this particular plant. It's a common sandhill plant, like the pawpaw. Uh, it also occurs in some scrub habitats down further south. Um, he saw them, had this, uh, it, it, he makes the comp, they saw them uh, uh, between the lower store and halfway pond. And if you have ridden through uh, uh, western uh, Putnam County, you know that it's Sand Hill. Um, as uh, the, the leaves of, Paul, of the uh, lupine, uh, this particular lupine, uh, covered with soft, white, silky hairs. It's a very distinctive beast. Uh, and it blooms in March. So here's another where, another spot where we can maybe predict as to when he was traveling through a particular area to give some idea of uh, uh, his travel uh, log. Uh, another plant that I find intriguing, there is a anise which occurs in the spring areas on the west side of Lake George. Now, it so happens that you can grow it up into Georgia as a uh, nursery plant, but it seems to be that this plant it has its main distribution around Salt Springs, uh, uh, Silver Glen Springs, those, small sp those springs that are occur, uh, that drain into uh, Lake George. And this is a yellow flowered one. Most of the ones up north or over in West uh, Florida near Tallahassee have bright maroon flowers. These, uh, the ones down in uh, uh, our area, are yellow flowered. In fact, there's now uh, some that are white flowered, um, and they're showing up in the uh, nursery industry. 
And this is Bartram's Ixia. It's an amazing plant. I've only seen it a couple of times. Um, if you read through Harper, who uh, sort of provides the best account of natural history uh, and everything else about Bartram, published in 1940, um, he claims that this particular plant was uh, seen uh, for, by Bartram uh, near Lake Dexter, which is south of here in Volusia County. Volusia County. Um, but the problem is that the modern records starting in 1921 show them in Baker County, they show them in uh, Duval County, St. John's County, Clay County, and northern Putnam County. They don't show them from anywhere far, uh, further south. So then that opens up the question, you know, where did he actually really encounter this beast? They occur in flatwoods, and a flatwoods is a pine uh, grassland. Uh, the soils are, uh, you might get a little bit of sand on the surface, but there are thick clays under that uh, uh, sandy layer. This plant occurs in moist flatwoods and uh, nowhere else. Also, it occurs where it, they burn the, the, the habitat a lot. It requires burning. It's an absolutely beautiful plant. This flower is about two and a half inches across. Um, but the vegetation, vegetative part of it is so minuscule that you would not even see it if you were down on your hands and knees. And so it's known basically by the flower. Here's a field of them. This, this is up in Clay County. But you know, it's just a beautiful plant. It, it's a member of the iris family. And let's talk a little bit about gopher tortoises. <laughs> it happens to be my favorite talk. <laughs> anyway, gopher tortoises occur from southern South Carolina down through uh, almost to the tip of Florida. Uh, it, uh, uh, Cape Sable, there's a population of them. They used to be along Cutler Ridge. They're no longer there that I know of. Uh, they've disappeared over a large portion of their habitat and they're protected species in Florida and actually in all the other states that occurs in, which is, goes all the way over to the L Florida parishes of Louisiana. It's a coastal plain species. Uh, there are four other species of gopher tortoises uh, in the world and all of them are in the western United States or in Mexico. And I'm very interested in uh, tracking uh, their distributions and their fossil record. Uh, I've been chasing uh, these rocks around now for a long time. Uh, I can catch them, <laughs> particularly as I slow down. Uh, but anyway, there are some really interesting aspects of this animal. First of all, they get up to about a foot in carapace length. Notice the front legs are very, very spade-like. They dig their burrows with those front legs. The females dig the nest chambers where they lay their eggs with their hind legs. Um, they lay on the average about five hard-shelled egg, uh, hard uh, eggs in a nest chamber, often right in that apron area where the uh, uh, their dirt gets pushed up from the, the tunnel. These tunnels can be up to 17 feet long. In fact, I dug one out as a graduate student, dummy. It was 40 feet long. There were about five of us, and we went through several cases of beer to do that. <laughs> so anyway, the uh, neat thing is that the gopher tortoise is considered a keystone species and that's a very special role in ecology. If you think of a, uh, the keystone in a stone bridge, that's that wedge that holds all the other rocks in place. If you pull that keystone out, your bridge collapses and this is what's happening with the gopher tortoise. The gopher tortoise is considered a keystone species and it, by the virtue of the fact that it digs these extensive burrows, uh, makes them this keystone species. By digging the burrow, they're bringing soil up from down deep and bring it to the surface. They're doing nutrient recycling. And also, um, several of us have spent, uh, again, those frivolous days of, of our, our childhood uh, investigating these burrows. And we now have a list of about 350 species of animals that live in the tortoise burrows. 20 of them, are found no other place in the world except in the tortoise burrow. So that makes them also uh, a keystone species because without that tortoise burrow, 
many of these things would go extinct. There's a mouse which occurs in the burrow called the Florida mouse or the gopher mouse. Uh, lives ex uh, almost ex exclusively in the burrow. They actually uh, modify the burrow and turning it into uh, uh, places to escape snakes because snakes also use those burrows. Uh, diamondbacks occasionally use them, but they're not as prominent as people uh, think. Uh, we did a lot of radio tracking out at the Ordway Preserve with rattle, diamondback rattlesnakes, and they would stop by a burrow for a while, but then they'd move on. Um, they like other kinds of habitats, and I'm going to talk about these uh, at the Santa Fe uh, uh, Lake uh, Audubon Society this next spring, and uh, we're going to go out to Ordway and see what we can find tromping around. But anyway, these... Um, these animals are really important to these upland habitats for those reasons. One of the neatest experiences I had last week, as a matter of fact, uh, Willie Lolosen uh, took me out to what he thinks is where uh, Bartram camped at Halfway Pond. And um, this is it on the left hand side. And uh, if you sort of look down the alley there, you'll see a, a little ridge behind it. That ridge is the thing that separates this pond from Calpen Lake. Um, he talks about, he uses uh, descriptors about this piece of uh, uh, campground. Uh, a rocky uh, shaded grotto, point of ro flat rocks projecting into the lake. Little cape of flat rocks where we fixed our camp. These are out of Bartram. So I was really wondering about that. I have a strong geology background too. And there ain't no limestone there. But what was there? And I had that resolved when I went over with Willie. And I brought a piece of it here to show anybody that's interested. This is kaolin. In fact, in the town of Egger, which is about two miles from this site, they still mine it. It's a high quality clay for pottery. And when you see, uh, if you look along that, that edge there, that edge sort of looks, uh, that sloping edge sort of looks like rock. Well, that's the kaolin. And I think that that's what he was talking about. And it's a very dense, hard uh, material. And I ha as I said, I have some, some up here so you can take a look at it. In fact, it even shows the annual varbs of uh, the layers of the, how it was deposited. It was uh, deposited in the Miocene and in a very low energy system where the clay was allowed to settle out. Um, and this bed is about 10 feet thick uh, in this area. So anyway, really cool stuff. And thanks to Willie for taking me there. The slide on the other side is to show you what a sand hill looks like. A uh, sand hill is a longleaf pine, turkey oak, and you can see the turkey oak there, and wire grass is all that bunch grass that you see. And uh, this is what he describes coming toward Halfway Pond, these rolling hills. It's a very, very descriptive uh, uh, approach, and uh, I find it wonderful. And again, um, I, it would be really neat if you're interested in this, this stuff, and you're, are, you're here this morning, bright and early, so you probably are, to look at Bartram's travels. It's, it's got incredible, uh, it's poetry in many senses. And, and uh, that was pointed out by Tom this morning, and it's, it's an incredible piece of literary work. Um, I, there are a couple of other things. One of the things I, I saw uh, in the Calpen Lake in, on several occasions are his uh, uh, great uh, soft-shelled turtles. Uh, and the habitat in this pond is perfect for soft, soft shells. And there are three species of soft shells in Florida. Two of them are river forms. One occurs only in the Pensacola area. One occurs in West Florida and in the St. Mary's River. River. And then the one that occurs throughout the rest of Florida is the one that he described and ate. And I also uh, wanted to comment that if he was talking about 20 to 40 pound turtles, they had to be all females. So um, the males are only about half the size. Huge amount of sexual dimorphism um, <laughs> displayed by these animals. So obviously he was selectively taking the females. And this is what they look like. They have that little snorkel nose. 
and they're an incredible predator. Uh, but uh, um, the females will get this big, and they come up uh, usually in the summertime to lay eggs, and you'll find them on sandy roads laying eggs around the margins of these ponds, uh, and they often come up during the rains. The shell, actually there is um, two shells. There is the center shell, which, and you can sort of see the, the edge of it running along uh, maybe about a quarter of the way up the shell from the back. That's a, a typical turtle shell, but the rest, the, the, the shell is covered with skin, and that skin extends out, and it's very flexible. That's where the name soft shell comes from. Uh, they also have some very powerful jaws, and they can nail you. I also wanted to comment, uh, you know, Bartran's been recognized for a long time as being very important in uh, Florida natural history. And uh, when we were on the river yesterday uh, having, having lunch, the big tree that we were under had that uh, uh, plant on the right-hand side, which is called Bartram's air plant, or Tillandsia bartrami. It's related to Spanish moss and ball moss. Uh, has really long uh, leaves and you'll notice the orange bracts coming off. This picture was taken down at uh, Hall Creek Preserve uh, when Jim and Carol and some other folks went down to visit. Um, over on the left-hand side, uh, Harper described the spring peeper, which is that uh, frog that goes peep, 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 peep in the springtime here. Very, in fact, here it's almost wintertime. And so the southern spring peeper bears his name. Just a couple more things. Number one, some of the stuff he described was just incredible, like rain lilies. Uh, I went up to uh, Kingsley Plantation, and they're growing indigo up there as a demonstration. That's an indigo uh, plant, the, the plant that produces the indigo uh, dye, and it's in flower there, it has pink flowers. And I just wanted to remind you also that Palatka itself has this really neat opportunity to explore uh, Putnam County flowers by this mural that's downtown on 3rd Street, I think, and St. John's. And so, anyway, that's Bartram's uh, Ixia, the uh, one on the left, and the pine lily, which uh, was named after Mark Catesby, which, who was another naturalist in uh, Florida during that same period of time. Okay, thank you.